Welcome everyone to this debate on equality. We're very happy to have you all here. And we're delighted to have with us today, Eric Lonergan and Mark Blythe for a presentation of their book, Angrynomics. Thank you very much, uh, Eric and Mark for being with us. Pleasure. Um, Mark Morgan will, uh, so he's a research fellow at the World Inequality Lab and is gonna give a short introduction on the book. And before this, I just wanted to present the debates on equality. So it's a cycle of conferences dedicated to uh, newly published books uh, in social sciences that deal with inequality issues. Um, so we run one to two uh, debates per month and the program is available on our website, wid.world, wid.world. The next debate in English will take place uh, on June, 30th, 30th, sorry, uh, with the presentation of the book, The Costs of Inequality in Latin America by Diego Sanchez and Cochea. So Mark, if it's fine with that, with you, the, the floor is yours. Thank you, Olivia. Uh, it's my great pleasure to present or to introduce uh, these two authors of this great book. Um, but just a word, it comes in a very timely moment in the last uh, session of our uh, debates on, on equality. We had a presentation of the of the French edition of the book, uh, Political Cleavages and Social Inequalities, co-edited by by Thomas, as well as other colleagues in, in the World Inequality Lab, Amory Pierta and Clara Martinez Toledano. And that book explored the social socioeconomic determinants of, of the vote in over 50 democracies since the 40s, and essentially uh, gave a picture of growing politicization of inequality over recent decades. Uh, and this book, uh, which is the turn of this debate on, on equality, Angrynomics by Eric Lonergan and Mark Blith, essentially explores why populations and voters have been getting angrier and what we and what policy can do about it. So it should be a fascinating discussion. So Eric is a macro hedge fund, hedge fund manager and economist and author who has written previously um, for Foreign Affairs, the Financial Times and The Economist. His previous book, Money, was published by Routledge. And Mark Blith is a professor, professor of international economics at the Watson Institute for International and Public Affairs at Brown University. And he is the author of Austerity, The History of a Dangerous Idea, among other books. And they're both, I should say, fellow Celts. So on that note, uh, the floor is yours. Eric, you want to kick us off? Right, I'm going to try and share my screen if that's OK, um, which I'm probably going to discover my, my computer won't let me to, but I'll cross that bridge when I come to it. I'll, I'm going to try and share my screen. Um, there we go. Maybe it will work. You'll need to make Alec like a co host. No, we're gone. We're good. All right, cool. Great. So, can you see that? You can see that okay. Right. So, I'm going to give a, a sort of quick summary of, of what we try to cover in the book. And I'm going to cover um, two components of this and then hand over to Mark um, to, to discuss one of the kind of core parts of the book. And then we'll, we'll end up with where we what we think the interesting uh, implications in terms of what can be done given this framework and analysis. And, and then we can open that to discussion because I guess that's, that's really the kind of interesting and dynamic part of, of what we're thinking about. So what we've tried to do in, in Angrynomics is first and foremost, I think the book is a description or an analysis of the current era. And Mark, I think, was the first person to describe our current era very explicitly. And I think he appropriately did it on Twitter um, when he sent out a tweet saying, this is the end of the era of, of neoliberalism and the beginning of the era of neo-nationalism. And I think that's really the crux of our hypothesis is that we think that the neoliberalism has been replaced with neo-nationalism. Um, and indeed, neo-nationalism may even be a, a, a more global phenomenon than neoliberalism was. If we think neoliberalism was predominantly 
an ideology of the developed world, although that's debatable because obviously it interacted very significantly with the developing world as well. But if one, for example, was to think about China in the context that are part of Asia, neo-nationalism might prove to be an even greater global force. It's worth perhaps coming back to this at a later stage, but that's the sort of overarching hypothesis of the book. Now, within that, we try to do three things. Um, the first is that we introduce really a theory of anger or more specifically a typology of anger. Um, we then do, or, or Mark, which Mark is gonna do is a, a sort of sweeping history of hundred years of political economy, which is done in one chapter. Um, thinking about the economy in terms of hardware and software. And then the third component of the book is an attempt to reconfigure our economies through a set of policies. So what I'd like to do to begin with is, is talk through this typology of anger. And I think this is helpful as an end in itself. So it's actually interesting um, to analyze anger but also it does give us a framework for making sense of what's happening in our politics. And really um, that, that was what motivated us. So I can remember very distinctly, Mark and I had a sort of theory of political economy or, or we had an analysis of the global political economy in the context of history, which explained what we thought was happening in the world. And we were about halfway through writing the book and Mark said, can we say something about anger? And it, it really forced us back to the drawing board because we suddenly realized, well, anger seems to be an essential component of what's happening. And yet we're very inarticulate when it comes to anger. So anger is a very interesting human phenomenon because we all know what it is, but we're very inarticulate when it comes to explaining it. So, if you think about anger, children get angry. All human beings pretty much know what anger is. Anger appears to be a phenomenon that cuts across ages, demographics, cultures, geographies. But how well do we understand it? And we then went and we read a lot of literature. So we're not psychologists, but we read lots of psychology literature. There's lots of literature in moral philosophy. Uh, in anger dating back to, to Aristotle. Um, there's lots of analysis about the effects of anger on voting patterns in political science. There's work in neuroscience about how the brain operates. There's lots of work in social psychology and history and in, 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 in sociology and in, in anger as a phenomena. And what was lacking when we researched anger was some kind of a general theory or some way of putting it into a single framework. And when we covered these really across many of these disciplines, we started to observe that there did appear to be a typology and that actually being explicit about this typology could help us in terms of understanding what's happening in the world. And really the typology had two dimensions to it. The first was a distinction between public expressions of anger and private expressions of anger. So that is one of the key distinctions we think that is very relevant when we think about anger as a motivating force in, in human behavior. And the second dimension to anger that is really intriguing is that particularly in its public expressions, anger seems to have two faces that are in fact, they're almost opposites, which is very, very intriguing to an economist thinking about anger. So there appears to be an anger of devils and an anger of angels. So if I start with the anger of devils, if you look into the, the social psychology literature, um, anger appears to play a role in tribal identities. And so one of the things that we did right at the beginning was we did a big data search using IBM's Watson Analytics and this searched through tens of thousands of stories and classified the stories by reference to anger. So this is really uh, forms of anger that are occurring in the public sphere. And the second most prevalent reference to anger related to sports fans. 
And in fact, once we identified this, this was a really interesting moment for Mark and I, because it's simultaneously intriguing and perplexing and blindingly obvious, right? So when you say to somebody, particularly if you're, you're somebody who attends football matches, and I think this is a, a broad observation, the idea that fans get angry is kind of obvious, it's self-evident, it's a truism. But then you start to ask yourself why. Um, and if you're sitting in the United Kingdom, Mark and I would go to watch football matches and we started to get distracted by the fans. You start to wonder to yourself, why is it that, that men, and it's typically men, pay money to go and watch often pretty unappealing games of football in very inclement weather in distant parts of their country uh, in order to get angry. <laughs> this is a very interesting phenomenon. Um, and I suppose as an economist, I was trying to work out what sort of a role was it playing. And if you look at the history of sporting events, it's quite shocking. So it appears to be the case that anger plays a role in identity or in identity formation or specifically in tribal identities. Um, and sporting events are almost a legacy of some kind of deeper rooted or primal instinct that we have that is associated along these lines. The other very, very interesting dimension if you study football fans is they don't just get angry with respect to the opposition. So that's a sort of predictable anger. But what's intriguing is they very often get angry with their own. So what is interesting in this instance is the two individuals who are on the verge of aggression are actually both uh, fans, appear to be fans from the same team. They're both wearing red shirts. And I started to observe this phenomenon of football matches that very often violence will break out within a group over loyalty. And also a lot of the anger is directed at, at the footballers who lack sufficient commitment to their tribe or indeed to managers. So if you look at, very often it is the case that the footballers that are most popular with the fan base are those that are most committed. So anger in the public sphere appears to be related to tribal identity. It appears to be a form of tribal, tribal regulator. And if you look within the use of English language, it's very intriguing. If you think of tribal identity as resolving a collective action problem, which is when a group faces the threat of resources and in effect needs to go into battle. So if we're genuinely in conditions of scarcity and survival requires that groups split and groups go to war, um, in a sense, going into battle is a collective action problem because you should always send somebody else to the front line. You don't want to be the first soldier to go into attack. And so you have this minority of angry fans that almost turn everybody into a color. Um, and it is this threat of violence, this loss of temper, which is a suspension of rationality and a suspension of ethics, in fact that then triggers the group or forces the group onto a violent footing. Um, and I think this is very evident in our politics. So one of, one of the things we'll come on to is if you look at somebody like Trump, who, who won't have any analysis of anger at his, at his uh, disposal, he in, in fact uses these techniques very, very efficiently. Now, the other intriguing thing about public expressions of anger is in fact the opposite which is the anger of angels. And this, in fact, if you do an analysis of news stories, the most frequent expression of public anger appears to be moral outrage. And again, this is really very fascinating because tribal rage is in fact the suspension of our ethical beliefs. But moral outrage is in fact the reinforcement of our ethical values. It's actually a response that our ethical norms have been breached. Um, and this is what we talk about in the book as kind of being legitimate moral outrage. And it's, it's very interesting because this is an idea that dates back in moral philosophy all the way back to Aristotle, where Aristotle viewed anger as in effect your moral compass, as in an appropriate response to a perceived wrongdoing. And again, it's very interesting in the context of collective action where 
you know, any economists here who, who, who've looked at issues in moral philosophy, we all know that, um, you know, microeconomics has a problem with moral behavior because there's always an incentive to free ride. And anger is very interesting in this context, particularly if it's, um, again, a kind of a temporary suspension of rationality in the conventional way, but it is a kind of non-formal regulator of our moral norms. And I've put here a, a, an image of Cornell West. As some of you may recall, there was a video of Cornell West went viral during the Black Lives Matters protests. And I think one of the, the comments that he made, I think he was on a CNN interview, was very, very revealing because it was really this Aristotelian notion of moral outrage, which is he, the, 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 what he said was, what would it say about our society if we witness police brutality like this on our screens and people weren't getting angry, if you didn't see people protesting on the streets and you didn't see an outpouring of outrage. And what he was effectively saying is that if you didn't get that reaction, um, you are operating in a moral vacuum. You, you lack a moral compass. So this is the first fundamental observation in our analysis of anger is that public anger seems to have these two forms. It seems both to be an expression of our ethical norms. So in the Aristotelian sense, it, it is something that should be listened to and is appropriate. But on the other hand, it is something quite dangerous in its devilish form, which is it can be a precursor to violence. And we see both of these forms of anger seem to be very, very present in, in contemporary politics. And really what we're trying to do is say, be aware of which expression you're witnessing because they really are opposites. So one is, some, is, is a call to action in a constructive and ethical way. And the other one is a precursor to violence. Now, the second distinction that we make before I hand over to Mark, is also very interesting, which is these two types of angers that we've described are really about public expressions of anger. But in the private sphere, anger seems to tell us something very, very different. So let me give you a contrast. If I had a colleague at work who all of a sudden starts getting very angry and shouting at people and losing their temper, you would typically take them to one side and say, is everything okay? Um, or, you know, are you under particular stress or is something going wrong at home? So in the private sphere, we typically associate um, anger, if anything, with shame. It's usually telling us that, that, that there is something going wrong internally. Um, but in the public sphere, you know, you wouldn't take aside an Extinction Rebellion protester and say to them, you know, is everything okay at home, right? I mean, I certainly I wouldn't advise that or they, they might, they may well, you might get, get a response that you don't like, but it's much more likely indeed if, if, you, if you speak to an Extinction Rebellion protester and you say, why are you angry? They're going to say to you, you should be angry too because you know, we're destroying our, our environment, we're destroying the planet for future generations, we're polluting our streams, um, et cetera, et cetera. So public expressions of anger, um, are actually expressions very often defended. There's one other very important point, I think, that, that, that is critical to this, the distinction between moral outrage and tribal rage. And this is a really, really important point, is actually um, the, the anger of the angels is articulate. And this is a, a point I want to, want to express because very often when, when Mark and I go through this typology, people say, Oh, really what you're just saying is the anger of angels or moral outrage are all the things you like. And the anger of danger, devils is the thing that you don't like. So you don't like tribalism, you know, but you do like uh, tackling inequality, for example. Um, so one you think is, is legitimate rage and the other one you think is illegitimate. That's really not true. So, so the distinction between the anger of angels and the anger of devils is not about one being right and the other being wrong. It, they're actually qualitatively different. So when you get expressions of moral outrage, 
actually people provide coherent reasons. So if you stop an Extinction Rebellion protester, they will actually articulate why they're angry. But if you go to two football fans or, you know, who are segregated, if you go to a, a derby, they don't provide reasons, right? Tribalism is an end in itself and it has a violent and destructive objective. Whereas moral outrage has a cognitive structure to it. People provide coherent reasons for their anger. And I think that is a very important di distinction. So you could disagree on ethical grounds with an Extinction rebe Rebellion protester, but the, the, the structure that argument will have is actually quite coherent. And it by and large relates to the interests of those who are affected uh, by a given action. So it is about giving equal weight to the interests of those who are affected. Okay, so that in, in broad terms is our typology. So anger, although it is something that we are all cognizant of, and typically something that we're quite inarticulate about, actually appears to be a more coherent emotion than it may appear at first sight. And it has these two dimensions. There is a, an anger of devils, there's an anger of angels, there is a public expression of anger and a private expression. And you can ultimately see how we then weave this into political economy. So we go from the abstract absolutely to the practical. And the practical becomes that elections are being won. You know, if you look at Trump, Trump, when, when he won the presidential election, but he, the same could be true if you look at the elections across the developed world, you can make the same argument if you think of Macron, is these are victories which are based on swinging fractions of a percent of the population, right? So, so Trump wins by swinging the votes of 80,000 American voters, a fraction of 1%. Angry people are more likely to vote. And he is specifically targeting moral outrage when he goes to the Rust Belt. You know, he's saying, I am your voice. You haven't been listened to. Globalization has destroyed your jobs. It's destroyed your incomes. It's destroyed your status. He uses actually ethical arguments to motivate people. And then he will switch effortlessly to talking about marauding Mexicans when he's in a, a marginal constituency where he thinks the tribal rage will motivate. And we saw exactly the same happening in the United Kingdom. If you look at the way the entire Brexit campaign was run, it was very, very explicitly targeting these differential communities and specifically targeting anger and utilizing anger as a motivator. And effectively our, our overarching hypothesis is that the political class is incentivized to win elections and anger becomes an incredibly powerful tool if you can target it electorally. And that one of the consequences of the, of the era of neoliberalism was a loss in political identity. And the, you know, the recurrent strategy in a vacuum amongst the political class is ultimately to target tribalism as a motivator. And I think the kind of trend of tribalism is one that you know, precedes in, in some sense, even the financial crisis, but has been one that has just been accelerated as the era of, of neoliberalism um, you know, has been discredited. And as a result, we end up with a typology that helps you to make sense of what we're witnessing, but is also uh, very concerning in terms of the direction with, within which global political economy is moving when you combine it with the incentives of the media and the incentives of the political class. And then the final argument that we put forward is that the, the, the case for optimism within the political sphere is that we focus on moral outrage and that we harness moral outrage in a way that will actually make a difference in a concrete way to people's lives to such an extent that it can become independently a political force. And I guess that, that is ultimately uh, you know, the challenge that we're trying to address. Mark, shall I hand over to you and you will yeah. put this into yeah. historical context and sort of flesh out the economics. Exactly. Then... Have you stopped sharing your screen? I can now set up mine. Okay, I'm just going to set up mine. Just give me a second. Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming along, tuning in. It's very nice to have this opportunity to chat with you. I'm looking forward to the question sessions.
So I'm not going to take too long with this. Let me just try and do this now. This opens up. Let's get to back to Zoom. Which one's Zoom going like this? I'm going to share screen. And there we are. And then let's go big scale with this. There we are. Okay, macroangrenomics. A few words by introduction. What Eric didn't mention is that if you haven't seen the book, the book is written as a dialogue, uh, which made it very unpopular with mainstream publishers. Because they kept saying, well, it's nice that you quote Aristotle, but the last time we saw the dialogue was by a guy called Plato. Um, so hopefully we've managed to bring this back into fashion. Uh, the audio book works very well because it's a dialogue and we actually do the audio book. But nonetheless, the, the, po the point in mentioning this is we didn't write this as a book for our academic peers. So it's really nice that our academic peers care about it, but it really was written for sort of the your smart person who's at an airport and has three hours to kill and is worried about the way the world is trending and wants to not be lectured to, but invited into a conversation that might help her or him understand why things are trending in such a way. And that was always our objective in doing this. So as Eric says, once we sort of found the anger theme and then we went back and really sort of got into this and used it as a frame, the question then became, you know, how do we connect this to the economy? Because as you all know, there's two broad sort of strains of academic thinking about the current moment. One is it's primarily cultural, it's loss of status, it's aggrieved white people, et cetera. And we certainly think that's part of it. But primarily, you know, maybe it's because we're all recovering Marxists at heart. We think that the economy is ultimately foundational in what's going on here. And of course, this stuff tracks very, very well historically in terms of, well, we've been here before. We have seen outpourings of public anger. We have seen increases in private levels of stress. This is not the only time that we've experienced this. So what can we learn from history? Now, the, the way that we wrote about this, of course, because this is a challenge. I mean, when, as, as Thomas knows very well, trying to condense history is a very, very dangerous thing to do and a very difficult thing to do. So I, when I get interested in things, I try and go to the conferences of the people who know more than me. So when I was doing the austerity book, I started going to bond market conferences and it's that type of environment where I actually met Eric. So I wanted to know about, you know, these terrible people called bond market vigilantes who want to destroy welfare states. And you go along and you find them and they don't. They care about portfolio protection and, and they wonder why Italy is behaving the way it is. And they're no more sort of, you know, let's say evil and aggressive and angry than anyone else. So I got interested in technology a few years ago because, of, of course, we're all going to replace by robots, et cetera, et cetera. And the way you get into these conferences is you do gains in trade. You talk to them about stuff that they don't know. And it turns out a lot of tech people are utterly clueless about the economy. So if you can talk to them, it's great. They'll invite you in and then you learn stuff from them. And, and that was great. And it was there that I developed this framework of thinking about capitalism as a computer and economic ideas as the software. And then you think about basically you go through cycles whereby the software becomes endogenously unstable because of bugs that are written into the software. You get system errors which crash it. And then you get resets, and those resets involve usually rebuilding at least part of the hardware, but definitely rewriting the software. And that became a nice kind of set of metaphor, or a metaphor to contain so much stuff. So this is what we try and do in the next two parts of the book. So macroangrenomics and microangrenomics. So essentially the argument that we make is that there's been three big iterations of capitalism basically in its modern form. And sort of the, 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 the best sort of um, name to hang the first one on is Karl Polanyi's analysis of the great transformation. So we have the quote here, to allow the market mechanism to be the sole director of the fate of human beings in the natural environment would result in the demolition of society. And Polanyi, of course, is famous for the double movement and all these various concepts which people have drawn from there. But, whoops, and why is that not working now? I need to go to the next one. There we are. Sir. So, but if we have to break this down and think about it in terms of the gold standard order, in terms of hardware, what was the hardware? Well, open markets, free flows of commodities, people and money, and the classical limited liberal state that was very much market conforming rather than market reforming. The software was classical economics, the idea, the doctrine, if you will, of laissez-faire, and the banker's doctrine of sound money and budget balance. The bugs in the software were exactly what Polyani pointed out, that 
labor is not a commodity. As I like to tell my students, I'm very fond of porcini mushrooms, but they don't care about their supply price. Workers do. And if you put them into a highly volatile environment, which is deeply competitive and wildly uncertain, that will become politicized and become an object of contestation. Labor is not, as Poyani said, a commodity. And the default response to this becomes a kind of nationalism and an appeal to the nation, that is to say this organic community which politicians respond to, as a kind of default container for those anxieties. And we saw this in the latter half of the 19th century in the build up to World War I. And the system crash was, of course, was World War I, and then the inability, because of the software and because of the way the hardware was structured, to put the system back together again in the 1920s, which ultimately leads to the Great Depression and the whole sort of terrible uh, strife of that period. So we have to go quite far to get to the next one, and that's kind of, if you will, the Keynesian reset. Now, of course, I'm not saying it's all Keynes that happened in this period. Of course, there was lots of other things going on. But in a sense, there was an attempt to do the following. The first thing was to rebuild the hardware. And what we ended up with under the Bretton Woods order were much more nationalized economies. Basically, these uh, uh, economies organized broadly under kind of Fordist domestic aus auspices um, made similar things, occasionally traded with each other, but also had capital controls, also had high taxes and transfers to fund welfare states as a kind of macroeconomic cushion. And crucially, regardless of how they got there, they all had a full employment target implicitly or explicitly is what you're trying to basically stabilize the system around. And the software was, of course, macro Keynesian macro stabilization ideas. And the bugs in the software in this one has came up in the 1970s, and I'm fully much a paid up member of the Kalekian and sort of, if you will, post Keynesian club on this one, was inflation and profit squeezes coming from two sources. One was the domestic power of labor and these very hot house containers uh, of economies that whereby there was no way to globalize production or to move capital abroad in any extent to basically get rid of those inflationary pressures. So we had a domestic way of pushing this up. And the second one was generalizing Fordism. It was fine for a handful of relatively rich Northern European countries in the United States to make cars and occasionally swap them with each other. But once everybody got into the game, the sort of stability of the relationships and inputs that made those things possible began to fall apart. So there was two sources of, if you will, bugs in the software. This leads, of course, to the 1970s and the system crash of stagflation that happens in this period. And then, of course, this leads in turn to the order that we've all grown up with, the neoliberal order, which, of course, you know, you could put lots of people in there, but there's a nice quote from Milton Friedman to get us going. Here, again, we see something very significant. There's a hardware modification. It's the globalization of capital markets, the integration of product markets. In a way, it's perhaps sometimes better to think of neoliberalism less as a set of ideas and more of a set of practices. That is to privatize, to globalize, to liberalize, to integrate, all of which restores the value of capital by basically taking the inflationary pressure out of the system, particularly through, basic, through uh, weakening labor's power and its ability to demand its share of the surplus. But that gets locked in very much in this period by a big hardware modification, which is the rise of the inflation target over the employment target and the rise of independent central banks. And then a whole series of ideas, of course, neoclassical economics, which interestingly at this moment are coming under pressure in a way that we haven't seen before with debates around MMT, with debates around the existence of a vertical Nehru, with the idea that there's so much slack in the economy, we can dump trillions into it and actually real, raise real wages without inciting inflationary pressures, etc. But that was essentially the setup that we had from the 1980s going forward. And the bugs in the software, well, this is the audience that would, of course, know a heck of a lot about this. Inequality is the big one, but it's also wage stagnation. It's also asset bubbles. It's also bank leverage. And all of that came together in the system crash in 2008, which was the global financial crisis. But this time, unlike the other times, when these macroeconomic crashes produce lots of public anger of various types, what you didn't get in 2008 was a system reset. There was no rebuild. There was no attempt to build, rebuild the hardware. Central banks just reinterpreted their mandates 180 degrees and build the system to the tune, depending on how you count this, $17 trillion yen and euros. None of the underlying bugs, what is actually generating inequality, what is generating precarity, 
why is it that capital share is increasing and labor share is not just stagnating, it's actually falling? None of those questions have been addressed seriously by any of the, so of the putative authors of the system, the politicians that we elect. At best, the software, if you will, the economic ideas, the neoliberal consensus, which basically said that stuff shouldn't happen, was patched. There was no fundamental rethink. That's taken at least a decade to get to the point where we're fundamentally questioning the software. The hardware is largely still the same. This is why we care so much about the ECB, particularly in Europe. It's why we care about what the Fed thinks about inflation. We're still more likely to know the name of the head of the Fed than we are the head of the Treasury. The only reason it's different this time in the United States is because at one point they were the head of the Fed. Um, as I said in another book, we made a terrible mistake uh, beginning in 2011 by thinking there was such a thing as an expansionary fiscal contraction. And that basically cost Europe in particular a decade of growth and has permanently damaged the labor market prospects of millions of future taxpayers, particularly in Europe and altered long run GDP trajectories. And the result of all this this time around is economics really becomes angrynomics. This is when we get fed up of the entire thing and you see that outpouring coming out at that particular moment. Just very quickly on this, I'm going to go through the micro side of this. And the micro side of this is very much inspired by the epidemiological literature on the correlates of public health and inequality. So the spirit level in work like this that appeared about five or 10 years ago, which I think is very, very persuasive. So what is this? This is capitalism is increasingly as a stress machine on the micro level. This is where the private side of anger intersects with, if you will, the externalities generated by modern capitalist processes. So we're still living in version 3.0 and it's still here and it's still very stressful. So what are these modifications? Well, deunionization de and labor market liberalization, which has led to an increase in inequality and precarious work, an increase in contingent contracts, a loss of benefits. You could add to that a loss of status, uh, particularly on single parent earners right across the OECD and other countries. If we see basically what's been happening in Latin America, uh, again, it was Chile that kicked it off, but now it's Colombia and Bogota, the riots there are very much a particular generational slice who have been most affected by these types of reforms actually making their lives more precarious. One that Eric pointed out, which I think is really important, which doesn't get so much of a shout, but is very important, is product market liberalization. Because unless you're one of the very big firms, and this is particularly true in industries like the digital space and pharma, unless you're one of the big firms earning near monopoly profits with exaggerated margins, if you're further down the supply chain, as most firms are, or you're in the service sector and basically you're competing domestically with other service providers with very low margins, everyone's margins get squeezed. This is one of the other causes of wage stagnation and also profit dispersal. The genie for profits is in some places higher than the genie for income. And this also gives rise to what some people have called the rise of the franchise economy, whereby control of assets and the sweating of assets becomes the name of the game rather than investment. And in such a system, it's labor that is ultimately being squeezed to produce the surplus, all of which is going to the capital side of the bargain. Financial market liberalization, of course, we know this already, tons of good work on this on credit bubbles, private debt builds up in financial fragility. And then finally, the globalization of production, which may not be the first thing that's causing this, and many of my colleagues in the United States are very keen to say, no, no, it's not globalization, it's not, but it certainly has helped push on to the capital share increasing, the wage share stagnating or falling. So all of this is, uh, leads up to Lenin's question, for those of you who remember, what is to be done? How do we calm the anger? And that's what we do at the back end of the book. And we call this, now we call this, we didn't call it this in the book, we call it moving the furniture around. And I'm just going to put these up here and then invite Eric to come back in and talk about them. We talk about how we could increase intergenerational equality through a citizen's wealth fund, building common assets through a digital dividend as a UBI seed, foolproofing recessions, direct monetary transfers, and also helicopter money and dual interest rates. So I'm going to leave them up there, but I'm going to kind of stop the share. Or will I leave it up? What do you think, Eric? Do you want to leave that up or do you want to go without that? Yeah, let's leave that up because it's good. Okay, I'll just leave it like that. You cool. All right, you go. So so Mark and I came, so in the kind of final third of the book, we, 
we say, what are the, the legitimate sources of, of moral outrage? So what are the sources of anger that are, are, a, are a call for redress? So what should we be listening to and what should we, in a sense, be af afraid of? Um, and, and these are all, all features that this audience will understand, but are still worth articulating. So the first one was a point about um, the extremes in wealth and income inequality. Um, and the second really is about the, 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 the cost of recession. So who is actually bearing the brunt of recession? Um, and that it is falling on, on the weakest in our societies. And then the third component is really a, a sense of insecurity. So fundamental insecurity in people's lives. And, you know, I started out studying labor economics and it's interesting when I go back 20, 25 years ago that, you know, we just assumed in a sense, well, why do you deregulate labor markets? Because you improve the trade-off between say inflation and unemployment and you can get a lower level of, of sustainable uh, employment or a lower level of sustainable unemployment if you deregulate a labor market. And yet the, the human question sort of, you know, is avoided in economics, which is, well, what did you actually do to the quality of people's lives if you deregulated a labor market? Which is you created a huge degree of insecurity. And so th th these are the three axes that we try to tackle, which is what can we do about wealth inequality? What can we do about the burden of recessions? And what can we do about insecurity in people's lives. And the challenge that we set for ourselves was that the recommendations or ideas would not fit obviously on the political spectrum. So we wanted to try and come up with ideas that weren't obviously of the left or of the right. Um, the motivation being that they would have a higher probability of, of success in terms of being implemented, but also they'd be more robust to electoral cycles. Um, we also wanted them to be relatively simple, and we wanted them most importantly to actually have an effect. And again, what's intriguing, if you put this in the context of what you learn in economics, in economics you don't really try to answer any of those questions, you just try and identify what's optimal depending on how you define optimality. And what did we come up with? Well, let me just briefly describe what we thought about wealth inequality, because it'll be thought provoking and it'd be very interesting to get this audience's perspective. And then maybe I'll say something very briefly about monetary policy, which I think is particularly relevant in the context of the Eurozone. So our idea with respect to wealth inequality is that in a way, the problem that we are trying to solve is the fact that very, very large percentages of the population in the developed world simply don't have any assets. So in a sense, what we, we were trying to work out is, is there a way of giving assets to the 80% of the population that doesn't have assets? And one way we propose to do this is to exploit a very substantial anomaly, which is between the state's cost of capital and the return on capital that is available to the private sector. So we, we can all observe, for example, that most developed countries today can issue negative real interest rate liabilities or debts fixed for up to 20 or 30 years. So most of the developed world can now raise finance at negative real interest rates for 20 years fixed. Now, the, 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 and, and, and in a sense, any economist will say, well, that means the state should be doing capital expenditure, right? Because all you need to do is generate a positive real return on your capital expenditure. If your discount rate is negative real, if you can generate a positive real return, you're actually creating value. The net assets of the state rise. The problem is, is we don't seem to be able to switch on capital expenditure as quickly as we can. So we thought, why don't we operate like an endowment? So why doesn't, for example, um, the UK government say, we're gonna actually have a separate budget account that's gonna be for a national endowment. And we're gonna issue 15% of GDP in 20 year fixed rate gilts, which have got a negative real return. And we're gonna give it to an independent authority with, with proper governance, who will put out to third parties to tender that they run this as a national endowment and their target return is between three and 6% real. 
That's all you need. Three to six percent real, they buy a diversified basket of global assets. And if you think those return expectations are unrealistic, we could look at Harvard Endowment or the Wellcome Trust in the United Kingdom or the Norwegian Sovereign Wealth Fund. Actually, getting something like a two to six percent real expected return, a real return from a diversified basket of assets is a very plausible target. Now, the interesting thing is if you do that and you take a 15, 20 year time horizon, by virtue of compound interest, you will in fact in, depending on what your returns are, but on very plausible sets of assumptions, within 15 to 20 years or perhaps even sooner, you'll be able to redeem all of the debt and you'll have 15% of GDP in assets. So what Mark and I propose that we do is, is that developed countries actually immediately set up sovereign wealth funds, which are debt financed, there shouldn't be a problem in terms of your fiscal position, if you think in terms of standard fiscal accounting, because of course your net assets are unchanged. You're issuing bonds, but you're buying assets. Okay, so you, you can worry about some kind of risk adjustment, but your net, your net debt doesn't change. Um, and what you can do is on day one, I mean, you could do this in a matter of six months, frankly, in the United Kingdom. You could then distribute ownership to 80% of your population you could effectively give them a share of that sovereign wealth fund or that national, national um, wealth fund. Now, this national, and of course, you can't draw that endowment down immediately, but then that's not how one should think about capital. Capital is supposed to be something that pays you a dividend or a reward through time, but you can instantaneously give people ownership. And with the passing of time and subject to return generation, 80% of the population could end up with a material ownership of the asset base. So this seems to us to square a lot of circles. We can, so particularly if you, if you put this side by side with a wealth tax, Mark and I are in favor of a wealth tax in principle, my concern would be about the political viability of having its effect. But the point is here in a sense, well, let's set, let's, maybe we can come back and discuss whether it's a tax or not, because this comes down to why can the government borrow at negative real interest rates for 20 years. But the point is it can. It's not obvious where this falls on the political spectrum, because, you know, on one sense you go, well, this is a left wing policy because you care about wealth inequality. On the other sense, you can say this isn't that different to what Margaret Thatcher advocated when she wanted, you know, people to own council houses and create a a property owning class in the United Kingdom. So you would be creating here, extending the ownership of capital through the economy. Um, and it also feels to me like something that could be done very, very quickly and make a material difference um, to people's lives. So that's the first proposal. The second- uh, can, I just, can I just jump in with one thing sure. here I want to clarify? Uh, in our original formulation, you just gave the genetic formulation of it, but it is important to say that there's money lying on the ground in the form of financial crisis. So we have built into version, baked into version 3.0, uh, endogenous instability, particularly in financial markets. And whether it's 2008 or whether it's COVID, equity markets fall between 30 and 50% in moments of crisis. And that's basically when the cost of capital for the state versus the private sector inverts. At that point in time, you could pick up all those equities and instead of putting them in the central bank and then handing them back to the top 20%, which is what we habitually do, that's when you can buy them all at an incredible discount. So you wouldn't just be buying them at the top of the market, you'd be buying them at a huge discount. So your compounding would come from a much bigger baseline. So I think it's important to say that you can actually do this, so if you can issue the bonds, but if you issue the bonds in a moment of crisis, you literally are picking up positive value for a negative real return, and that's incredibly important. So I just wanted to stress that a little bit. Yeah, and I, I would just add to that. It's a very interesting question when we come on to central bank behavior is why on earth do we buy government bonds in a recession? Why don't we buy cyclical distressed assets during a recession? Because in a sense, if you think about it from a macro stabilization standpoint, it makes far more sense to try and actually reduce the cost of capital to the private sector in a recession, because that's where the risk premium has built in. And in fact, the state's cost of capital collapses anyway, because of the private sector's demand for safe assets in it or negatively correlated assets during a recession. So also in terms of how the state is utilizing its balance sheet counter cyclically, this is very unwise. It would make a lot more sense to actually buy risk assets, but then, of course, you will generate a huge return as a state. And we've seen this in the past, whether it's the Hong Kong Monetary Authority 
or in fact the Bank of Japan buying equities, there is in fact a huge creation of financial wealth for the state, whereas it's not obvious what the consequences of quantitative easing are. Now, the, the, the final sort of area of, of, of policy that I think is worth reflecting on relates to monetary policy. And I think this is particularly important in the context of Europe, because, uh, and again, I would stress this as a matter of practicality rather than optimality. You know, Mark and I are, are attending later this month a conference uh, in Berlin about redesigning the fiscal rules in Europe. And you know, I think it's a fascinating intellectual exercise and you know, I, I, I wish Olivier Blanchard all the best, but I think the probability that we are going to get a political consensus in Europe to have fiscal policy along uh, US and Chinese lines, to me is, I, I would give a close to zero probability to that, that outcome. That the practical reality of macroeconomic life in the Eurozone is monetary dominance. And I think it's going to be extremely difficult to shift that. So given monetary dominance, can monetary policy be run in a way that works for society? And I think it, it is increasingly obvious that monetary policy, as it is currently designed, is both anachronistic. So it, it, it is an artifact of a random history, which is central banks were set up in the 1800s by and large, um, to, to effectively finance the state and provide liquidity to, to banks. And we've ended up, um, uh, over a century later, all of a sudden we've given them the, the entire role of macroeconomic policy. And, and simply the interest rates as a tool is totally dysfunctional. Um, and you don't even have to believe, you know, you, not to mention the fact that it, it's clear that when we get down to zero interest rates, the marginal benefit of interest rates, if they go negative, whether there's a reversal rate. The point is it is dysfunctional. It's creating huge risks within the financial sector and it is singularly failing to provide sufficient um, macroeconomic stabilization. And, it, and our observation is a very simple one, which is how would you design a central bank with a blank sheet of paper? Um, and I think it's very hard to argue that you wouldn't say we would try and stabilize household incomes in many ways in the same way that fiscal policy has tried to do that during the pandemic. And the obvious route to do that would be to give central banks the power to make transfers directly to households. And so you would effectively transition to a post interest rate based monetary policy. Now, that, that's one component. The other component here, and I think is interesting, is, and, and this again is very, both of these I think are specific to the Eurozone, because both of these policies may in fact both be legal within the context of the Eurozone, but also almost by accident, somebody very, very clever at the ECB has devised the tools, and the tools are Teltros. And the way that the ECB could provide, effectively make cash transfers to households in the Eurozone would, buy, would be by doing perpetual zero coupon Teltros to households. So in other words, you say, we've got a new Teltro program, which is a, which is a perpetual loan at zero interest, and we will make it available to all Eurozone citizens. And you can determine what quantity, so you say we'll do 500 euros per quarter or a thousand euros per quarter until we forecast a return to price stability or a return to our inflation target. Um, and that could be distributed to, to the banking system and every European citizen would be able to apply for a Teltro through the banks. Um, that's one option that would be available to the ECB. The other fascinating thing is that the ECB has in effect adopted dual interest rates. The problem at the moment is, is that most people aren't aware of this, and so most citizens aren't aware, and a great many macroeconomists aren't aware, and macroeconomists and citizens haven't thought through how effective dual interest rates could be, and how, and how you could utilize dual interest rates in a way of which we are all huge beneficiaries. And I give a very simple example. Dual interest rates absolutely solve the problem of the zero bound because they are limitless monetary stimulus. And it works like this. Let's say the ECB, it's a very interesting point is the ECB did not cut official interest rates during this pandemic. So they left the, they did not change the target for the interest rate in money markets 
right? So money market interest rates in the Eurozone have effectively been unchanged. What they've done is they've effectively raised the average interest rate that banks receive on reserves, and they cut the interest rate on Teltros, which is on loans that they make to banks, subject to the banks meeting certain criteria. Now, here's a simple point. If I want to stimulate demand as the ECB in the Eurozone, how can I guarantee that it will happen? Well, let's say I do a Teltro at a minus 5% interest rate fixed for five years. Okay, now all I can, I can pretty much determine how much monetary stimulus I want it would be how big that Teltro program is. So if that is contingent on the banks making new loans, the banks could make new loans at minus 2% interest rate fixed, and they'd make a 3% spread. Now, bear in mind, deposit rates do not change because money market interest rates haven't changed. The interest rate on reserves hasn't changed. I'm just independently cutting the rate on Teltros. But let's say I'm actually looking at the Eurozone and going, I don't want just loan creation. I want to green our economy, right? And we all agree with that. In fact, I want us to create a boom in sustainable energy investments so that we accelerate all of our carbon emission targets. So I'm going to do a Teltro at minus 5% fixed for five years, eight years, or 10 years, conditional on loans being made in sustainable energy investment. All of a sudden, what you realize is that not only is a dual interest rate or a Teltro system has no limit to the monetary power, the use with which you with, within this new central bank, within new monetary policy, you have the ability to remove a dependence on effectively asset price inflation and intermediation through financial markets. And you could design monetary policy without threatening the independence of the European Central Bank, but you have a framework whereby effectively they're directing capital investment through a dual interest rate structure. Now, obviously the governance for this piece would need to be worked out, but this could easily be done. The European Parliament could actually take control of events. It could, it could come out and say, we would support the European Central Bank if they, announce a dual interest rate Teltro program, which is the eligibility of which is green investment spending. And indeed, the Commission could define those terms. So there's absolutely no reason why not. The eligibility could not be, in a sense, subject to democratic process. But the magnitude of monetary stimulus and the pricing of the monetary stimulus would remain entirely uh, the mandate of the European Central Bank. I think we're done. Thank you very much, Mark and Eric. This was an outstanding presentation. Um, I think Mark is gonna um, is gonna lead the Q and A session. Yeah. So I can gather a few questions, maybe on the same theme, and then you can answer if that's okay with you, Mark and, and Eric. Yeah. Sure. So uh, first few questions have to do with information and alternative facts and link to anger. So do you see a link between anger of the devils and alternative facts? What is the role of information in triggering the anger and which anger? So my quick take on this, I'll pass to Eric, is that there's a hell of a lot of information in anger. And what it does is it points to the gaps in, our, in the way that we normally think about politics. So I'll give you an example of this. Um, I can't stand that whole philosophy of nudge. I, I truly think it's kind of horrid because what it does, it's a kind of, it's, it's technocracy taken to the worst possible degree, whereby I no longer have to rationalize my decisions. I no longer need to debate with my fellow citizens. I just view these people out there somehow as a social problem that needs to be nudged into better behavior. So it immediately divides the world into the technocratic elite that knows stuff and then a bunch of dumb people who need to be nudged. And I think that sadly, many of our societies went quite far down that line. And when you go down that line, you basically, you, you think that everything that you say is information and everything that everyone else says is nonsense. So you're literally unable to hear the articulations, moral or otherwise, of the people who are most affected by the way that the economy works. So I think that anger isn't just noise. 
And it isn't just distortion or manipulation. It is actually information about the fact that the policies that we're doing and the practices that we, that we govern the economy with do a great deal of harm. But because we were kind of stuck in this very technocratic mindset, we were completely unable to see this and anger became the response. Eric. Yeah, the distinction, it's really important that we try to get clear on the distinction between the anger of angels and the anger of devils and, and, and make clear that it's not about taking sides, but they are qualitatively different. Um, the, 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 so the logical conclusion of tribalism is violence. That's, that's in a sense its function and it's a response to scarcity. Now, moral outrage does have the threat of sanction, right? But, but its objective is not violence and it's not a response to scarcity. It's a response to the breaching of a norm or the disregard of the interests of other people other people, people who are being affected aren't being listened to, right? So this is a very typically a, a source of anger is that something significant is happening and we're not being listened to. That is very, very different qualitatively, right? To the football fan. Now, the thing about the football fan, I want, I saw there was something about, you know, football fans being working class. This very much depends where you are, right? Um, and, and, and which football fans. Uh, which clubs. Now, I should say, I love going to football matches, and, and I always go now because I love football. Um, you can see the best football on television, but you get the best atmosphere if you go to where the craziest fans are. So, so I, Mark, I've taken Mark, we've gone to some really, really hung out with some really, really crazy fans. Now, what's important about tribalism is it feels amazing. Right, right. Tri this is why we pay to be tribal, because tribalism is an incredible feeling. And Mark, you, uh, Mark with the C, Mark Morgan, you know, you know, growing up in Ireland. I mean, I was very struck by this when I grew up in Ireland in the 1970s. You know, very interesting politically because Ireland kind of missed the Cold War. We never had a right or a left. We just we we went tribal first. You know, we missed neoliberalism and went straight to neo-nationalism. Okay, kind of 30 years early. Um, <laughs> The problem is that, again, it's, it, 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 it feels great, but it manifests itself, it boils over into violence. And I think that's the important thing that we have to be careful about. And if you look at the social psychology literature that we talk about in the book, our propensity to become tribal is so reflexed, so hardwired, and it is very, very dangerous. And once you unleash it, as soon as I say, I'm Irish, you know, you're not Irish. And so as soon as one group declares an identity, the other people are forced. So it's like we, we shift colors as a crowd. And, and of course we have civil wars as well, which is very interesting that how you can even, you know, set the group can split. But th this is a very, very dangerous and pernicious phenomenon. So it is really important, I think, to be aware of these two sides. All right, so uh, on that question, which was a, quite a long question, saying that uh, the working class going to football matches, they may not be as articulate, but should that disqualify their anger as a form of discontent? I think that was the... That was my answer. Yeah, cool. Um, another question, where is neoliberalism going to go, given that it will survive the pandemic? So this is an interesting one. Because I think it depends on which side of the, curve, the, the academic barricade you are. So if we identify neoliberalism as a set of practices that is about market integration, globalization, financial liberalization, etc., you're not going to unwind that very quickly, right? Even if you wanted to. Uh, one of the things I like to say to my students is, so if you're against this order, how many of you are willing to give up your credit cards? because you know, you're gonna to have to go back to like price controls and things like this, right? This is how it works. So are you willing to give up the financial freedoms that the current moment has given you? No, absolutely not, right? So there's certain things not gonna wind back. But at the same time, if you're stuck in, as I call them on Twitter, the inflation wars, right? That's going on at the moment, then there's a real shift in ideas that basically say, well, hang on a minute. 
if this vertical Nehru thing that we've all basically assumed is true, that if you keep spending money, it's only going to show up in higher and higher prices, if that turns out to have been wrong, and impressionistically, we knew it was wrong for 20 years because you used to do country level um, Phillips cups. And what you would find is that unemployment would jump around all over the place, but the rate of inflation would be pretty constant, right? So we kind of knew this, but we didn't really have a theory as to why a really good data is to explain what, what this is going on. I think this is changing. And if that is then basically one of the real cornerstones, not just the sort of macroeconomic theory, if you want to identify that as being neoliberal, I personally think it's far more plural than that. I think that's an unfair characterization. But it certainly questions things like neoliberal governance. It certainly questions things, not so much like central bank independence, having an independent monetary authority, I don't, I don't actually think is a problem, but basically saying we have a 2% inflation target and that's the only thing we give a crap about really becomes deeply problematic. Hence, we will rethink the rules. So it's going to survive the crisis, but it's going to survive the crisis in the way that I survived my teenage years, right? I'm no longer a teenager, but I survived. I don't look like a teenager now. It's going to evolve. It's going to change. We will get to a different place. And, and just final on that one. And the one thing that's really going to make it happen is two things. Number one, the pandemic has shown the Anglo countries, the ones that are supposedly the most neoliberal, that fiscal policy is available and powerful and quite possibly non-inflationary, at least for quite some time. And there is a thing called the decarbonization, green transition that needs to happen. And as Eric says, we simply do not invest enough in it. And we're going to have to find the fiscal ornament and monetary ornament to do that. So I think all of those things are pushing in a direction that will transform neoliberalism rather than just replace it with some version of the 1970s. Great. Another one here um, on dual interest rates. So do you think that the likelihood of adopting dual interest rates to support, say, green energy has increased in light of France and Germany discussing uh, economic autonomy or economic governance, particularly in light of the Eurozone apparently loosening their debt rules? Over to you, Alec. Yeah, I mean, I, I think there's an. I mean, I think there's an awful lot of debate. The, the, the fiscal rules, you know, are kind of patently redundant. Um, but I, I cannot see, on a, on a medium term view, Europe um, avoiding a tendency towards austerity. Um, and, and it is very, very preoccupying, but I just don't think that Northern Europe is going to say, first of all, I don't think the proposal that you just set up a committee of experts that are gonna agree, argue from one year to the next and decide what, uh, what the right budget deficit is for Italy. I just don't think that's viable on any level. Um, there's no way that, 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 that nation states would delegate that power to a committee. And there is no way that that committee would have any democratic legitimacy, particularly if it actually tried to force the hand of any country or impose a sanction. I think that would be absolutely disastrous. So you know, as a European, I'm, I'm deeply concerned about the, the, the kind of future institutional arrangement in, in the Eurozone, because uh, particularly where, when I look at Italy, um, yeah, the fundamentals in Italy have deteriorated dramatically as a consequence of COVID. And the, the way I think of it is, is that European debt markets, sovereign debt markets in Europe, they function in a crisis and they come under stress in a recovery. Um, that's what happened last time. Um, and I, I'm deeply concerned that once we're out of the COVID crisis, uh, if all it would take is a change in government in Italy or any type of, of political crisis, which I would have thought is a high probability if you took a 10 year view, um, because I think we're because of neo-nationalism and populism, in which case there'll be a run on the Italian government bond market. And this is why I, I've been arguing, continue to argue that the European Central Bank needs to make the case for European citizenship. You know, if I'm an Italian household, what is Europe doing for me, right? You, Europe just kills me every time I've got an economic problem. I have a banking crisis, it makes it worse. There's a financial crisis, I get given a sovereign crisis. You know, so, so if you look at how the pendulum 
in Italy from being pro-European to being anti-European has swung. This is not a sustainable equilibrium. And, and at the same time, I cannot see Northern Europe saying it's okay for Italy to run a debt GDP ratio of anywhere between 160 and 200% of GDP. Um, I can't see that. And, and the fiscal stimulus isn't sufficient enough. The recovery fund isn't big enough. In which case it's down to the European Central Bank. So to the, to the, the kind of dual interest rate point, um, they have to do it. Because other, otherwise there's going to be a huge trauma at some point. So it's very interesting to me because I don't believe we're in the era of neoliberalism anymore because to me neoliberalism was, was where the world was moving in one direction. The only common thread I can see globally is nationalism. And nationalism, by definition, by definition implies a non-common economic ideology because I do what's in my national interest. So China you know, is pursuing completely different sets of macroeconomic policies. America has dominated the narrative, but America is the unique case of renewed fiscal dominance. So it is clear that the liberal elite in America is, is, has been scared, has been terrified by Trump. And in response to this, the unintended consequence of Trump is they are actually willing to do something for their citizens, finally. And they want to make it, and that's a huge experiment. It's a political experiment. Will delivering material economic reforms for your citizens result in electoral success? You know, they better win again because otherwise everybody's going to be a nationalist. And then if you look at the developing world, you know, you look at Turkey, et cetera, you look at Russia. I mean, is there any coherence in economic policy? The only coherence is nationalism. So the, the Europe, and, and Europe is, is in a very strange situation because we've made fiscal policy illegal and we've set it up in terms of the internal politics that it's impossible to break fiscal policy on a sustained basis. We've made monetary dominance a legal institutional fact. So we really need to redesign monetary policy. And we have rising populism and nationalism within Europe. I'd just add one little thing on top of that, which is a historical cause. If you look at the bits of the Eurozone that have grown since 2008, or no, 2010 really, it's the Northern countries and the export supply chains of Eastern Europe that are integrated into them because they are dependent upon demand that is generated outside of the Eurozone by and large. So the thing about exporters, we know as late developers that they rely upon consumption suppression. They rely on weight, relative wage stagnation and they rely on an undervalued exchange rate. None of that screams fiscal stimulus. None of that screams fiscal dominance. They're quite happy with the framework as it is. In fact, if you were to do it exactly what Eric is proposing, or you were to have an Anglo type solutions, it would destroy the business models of those economies. They simply wouldn't be able to do it because the exports would cost too much. So there's a structural structural fact that is built into this in the design. Can so I neither of us are dreadfully optimistic on that one. Can I just come in here um, on, on this point and um, and remark that the ECB, ECB intervention itself is not without its detractors, specifically as we go beyond the pandemic, as we saw with constitutional court challenges, you know, in country in Germany, for instance. And but nevertheless, you still think that the probability of those interventions getting done is higher than a fiscal rule change or fiscal rule overhaul. I mean, I do. One thing I'm very struck by, but I'd be very interested to know what other people think. I mean, is I, I go along to a, to a conference in the in the UK of kind of European policymakers every year, and it's it's genuinely pan-European. The, the the British are in a small minority, and there's always a contingency of German economists and policymakers, and they always listen to me and they go, I agree with the first third of your diagnosis. The middle third, I start to kind of, you know, begin to question you. And then by the end, I think that, you know, this guy's mad. There's no way we can do this in Europe, right? And that's been the case for the best part of the decade, except on the last occasion when I spoke about dual interest rates. And the German economists came up to me and said, this is the first time you've got to the end of what you've had to say, and I've still agreed with you. So the interesting thing is that the idea, the Germans do not want negative interest rates so if you leave official interest rates unchanged, or if you even raise deposit rates, I don't have a problem with the ECB saying, let's raise deposit rates to one and a half or 2%. Northern Europe should be very happy, but I'm gonna do targeted lending for capital expenditure in, in green energy investments at minus two or 
Now, it's not obvious to me. I'm not, you see, I would rather do that. You're not financing any governments. That's not a bailout to Italy. That's, that's not even, QE, frankly, is much more questionable in terms of legality than doing this. This is directed lending through the commercial banking system to the private sector. And in fact, if you look at banking history, you know, we haven't, we, I, 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 don't think, I don't think the Bundesbank has lent at negative interest rates, but there have been, you know, central banks is so much they think of it legally, they look at precedent and convention. If you look at what the Japanese did around Fukushima, they, the central bank did something similar. If you look at what the Chinese central bank is, if you look at our central banks historically, they have, of course, allocated credit to, to, to directed credit to specific parts of the economy. So I think the case can be made. But it does require political bravery. And I think it requires economists to some extent to stand up and start making the case for these policies. So, sorry, Eric, if I can uh, jump in, I, I want to make sure I understand exactly. What, so you, you're proposing to lend at minus two, minus three, so in effect to, to subsidize, uh, you know, to give plus two, plus three to someone. Uh, so to whom exactly? So who will be these actors that will be able to, to, to borrow at minus three? If you look at the existing, so one of the most extraordinary things that happened during the pandemic very early on is that the interest rate on the Teltros fell below. It was specifically designed to be below the, the average interest rate on reserves. So banks are being funded by the ECB at an interest rate that is lower than their deposits at the ECB. Now, historically, we've all thought as an economist, you can't do that because I'm a central bank, I can free ride. It's like having a lower discount rate to the Fed funds rate. Well, I could just borrow from the discount window, deposit with the Fed, and I earn a, and I earn a profit as a bank. But the ECB has been very clever about it. It said you're only eligible for this financing if you meet these conditions. So you have to make new loans to SMEs, or you have to make you have to expand your loan book. There's no requirement under the ECB scheme that you pass that benefit on. You just have to expand your credit. But if you look, the Israelis have done this and they attach different strings. They said you have to lend to small and medium sized enterprises. The Bank of Japan said you have to lend to Fukushima reconstruction. And I've been talking to the Bank of England because the Bank of England had a very similar scheme, but it was, it was originally designed for housing, which is a very bad idea because you just increase the mortgage bubble and the housing bubble, but then they redesigned it and they aimed it at small and medium sized enterprises. But why don't we think about sectoral requirements? Like why not do it for regions? And why not cut the interest rate much more aggressively? Right, so, and, and why not make it a requirement that you pass it on? So instead of saying to the banks, I'm gonna subsidize you and protect your net interest margin, I'm going to say, no, I'm going to, I'm going to give you maybe half a percent, but I want you to pass 200, two basis, two percentage points onto the energy company or the infrastructure company. So you could actually pass through, you, you can make conditions. But this is fascinating because suddenly mm -hmm. there's no zero bound. Okay, we can go as, because we're not cutting deposit rates. We're leaving money market interest rates and deposit rates unchanged. But we're just cutting the interest rate on these targeted loans. Mm. And I would just quite, I would just say if you if you if you're worried about the fact that what the central bank then doing is creating liabilities on its balance sheet by doing this, then there's a perfect case for taking passive ownership in these new industries, right? So you could use it as a way of doing a smart version of a kind of passive nationalization, whereby the public would get at least ten, perhaps 10, 15 percent of the ownership in these new green industries and then would get the upside as they come to maturity. So again, you wouldn't be really altering, you wouldn't be saying to the central bank, you need to take this risk because ultimately they'd be able to buy the equity on the other side as a condition as part of Eric's pass through. So there's other ways that you could do this so it's not just the subsidy to banks. The, 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 the problem with, it, with, with us as economists, right, is economists quickly go, who's losing money? And then they go, the central bank's losing money. Right, because the central bank on these operations has a negative net interest margin. So you, you can get lost in the question then of whether the central yeah, bank- I, I, I'm actually, I'm not too concerned about the central okay. bank losing money, but rather who's going to gain from that? <laughs> so well, who's you, gain? You know, the, 
it, you could do infrastructure spending. So if, if you, no. so you suddenly, if you think infrastructure is ideal here, green energy investments are perfect because if you've got a regulated return, all you do is you will result in lower electricity prices and you will increase your capital expenditure because, you know, if, if you look at most European infrastructure spending probably has a required return of somewhere between three and 7%. Right. Well, if I change and it's most of it is debt financed. So you fix your debt costs. You work out what your return is based on electricity prices. You do the capital expenditure. Well, if, if I suddenly reduce your debt cost by 500 basis points, you'll do a whole load more capital expenditure. Yeah. No, I, I mean, it, again, it depends who's going to benefit. You know, if it's if it's lending to region or local government, you know, that's one thing. But if in the process you have, a, you know, a big... Uh, you know, large private companies that make huge gains out of this, you know, I think you're going to have a big problem very, very soon. So I don't, you know, the governance system that you have in mind for this sure. is going to be key. And I, I have just a, a little bit the same, uh, well, the similar question for your uh, wealth fund. So your wealth fund is you, you, you borrow 15% uh, of GDP and you invest it in the world capital market as a UK government or French government. And with the extra return you make, you you then distribute wealth to uh, everybody. Now, you know, it's not it's not only that I prefer taxation because it's it brings a lot more money. So you know, private wealth is uh, like five hundred percent of GDP, including one hundred percent of GDP owned by the top one percent or more. So you know, there's so much more money here to take to distribute to the rest of the population. So I tend to prefer that a lot, a lot more. That's a lot bigger. It's a lot more direct, and also by doing what you describe with your wealth fund. You know, aren't you? contributing to the sort of world, uh, uh, you know, uh, speculation and world financial markets trying to get high margin. And, you know, what's, what's going to be the impact on the labor share at the world level, according to you? You know, if you have this, you have these extra actors, uh, government, you know, who try to get but high return. Well, yeah, you think you that's going to be any good for the, for the labor share? Yeah, I mean, if you generalize the category, well, you need to break down the category. If, if, if workers become capital owners, if even in a passive sense, then they're accumulating that wealth as well. It's more than just a, a sort of a nominal claim. So you would actually have to recalculate the labor share because the labor share would not just be a function of wages. No, 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 Mark, yeah, you're cheating. Uh, you're completely cheating. Oh. No, 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 no. <laughs> Now, if you completely, if you don't care anymore about wages, you know, that's another matter, but you know, I'm, I'm not talking, I, look, okay. I can, I can redistribute wealth, you know, with a wealth tax, uh, yeah. that's one thing. And at the same time, you can strengthen unions on minimum wage and increase the labor share and you can gain on both sides. Now you're telling me, uh, okay, maybe the wages are not going to increase. No, no, I'm just saying. Can I come in here a second? Can, can I come here a second? So I, I would tend to. I, I don't. I, I, I don't see any reason why having a national wealth fund impacts the labor share. You know, you know, my, my personal preference on the labor share is to run the economy hot and stay as close to full employment, right? But I still, I want to run a very tight labor market where real wages get bid up and I maintain product market competition and put pressure on margins. That, that would be my preference. But, but, my, but the thing is here, I think your more fundamental point is, might you be contributing to asset market speculation, bubbles, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, I, I would just say, no, I, I, I think if you look at the endowments as a model, look, the Norwegian Sovereign Wealth Fund is really interesting as a model. You know, it is now the case that more than 50% of its assets are due to compounded returns, right? So it's no longer just the, the oil revenues, it's actually been return generation. And, and the reality is, if you look at how markets are priced, particularly in Europe, right? We, we tend to always talk about the United States and the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ and you know, Bitcoin, all this speculative stuff. If you look at European equities, you, you've got a huge equity risk premium. They are perceived to be very risky assets by private sector participants. So we, well, all we're doing is exploiting a very odd feature of capital at the moment, which so in, in many sense, I think the interesting question is why is the private sector willing to lend to the state? 
at negative real interest rates fixed for 20 years. And in effect, we are taxing wealth. I mean, I, I think about this in the Japanese context. Very interesting question. Why is the Bank of Japan trying to generate 2% inflation? It seems to me it is a, it's an intergenerational wealth transfer. Because if I look at the ownership of the bonds, it's actually hugely skewed distribution. The people who own the bonds is a tiny percentage of the population. Now, if they want to lend to me at negative real interest rates and they want to sell me, the global capital system wants to sell me ownership in capital at a four to seven percent real return. I mean, the implied real return on European equities is about six percent. If I'm the German government, I should just buy this. I should be buying the stock market. But you don't just buy the stock market. Run it like an like Harvard endowment. Target a four to six percent compound return over 10, 20 years, and then you can repay the debt and you've given ownership to 80% of your population, you could do 30 or 40% of GDP. I mean, Germany could do 40% of GDP. So look, I, if you, you do a wealth tax, fine. That's not a problem. I have no problems at all with that. But why don't we just do this as well, just in case we don't get the wealth tax through. And then I'm gonna give, I'm gonna give you know, if, if you do the numbers on it, you know, even, 20, 30,000 euros or pounds to people who have no assets, it's material to people. They, 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 they do have a small share in the system. Um, and the beauty of it is I haven't, I haven't had to fight any battles, right? I mean, look, I'm, I'm well, willing to try and go on a careful, wealth battle. Be careful but, with that, you know, be careful with that. If you don't have to find any battle, maybe it means there's a problem somewhere. <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, but so, I mean, yeah, but you know, it's uh, I, I to me, in effect, it is a wealth tax. Uh, but it's actually a wealth tax that people are paying voluntarily because uh, they're buying the bonds. Well, it's a wealth tax, except that the gainers are the people at the top. You know, that's the only problem. That's no, no, no. But if I'm <laughs> issuing, but, but no, but I'm buying the equity and distributing it. If, if, if effectively at the moment, what you observe with the cost of capital is. If you think we own the state's balance sheet, we have this incredible gift, which is we can issue 20 year bonds at negative real interest rates. That is like discovering oil. And yet our politicians won't use it. And I'm just saying, well, no, look, how I, can I, I say, let's use, use it. it? I want to use it for public investment, public sector jobs. I just don't want to use it to extract a surplus from private sector workers. You know, that's all. <laughs> but, uh, and Eric, this is the, the universal dividend that would be distributed would come from this as well. Is that correct? Well, we've, what we've looked at is with data dividends. So we just think we should enforce our property rights when it comes to data. And so we should auction data and that the proceeds from auctioning our data. So it's, it's much like we auctioned, if you think of the telecommunications companies who were auctioning um, spectrum, um, you would effectively do the same thing with our data. So if Facebook wants to use our data, given that we own it, we should negotiate as a collective and say, this is, we're going to put it out to tender and we'll sell it to the highest bidder. Tom, can I just come back on your point though about, I, it doesn't, I, I if we, even if we raise the labor share in, in GDP, Okay, the return on capital, you see, I, I don't actually think stock market returns don't have to be premised on exploitation. They're just premised on a return on capital in equilibrium, right? So, and what you could change that. So you could say, well, they've made too high a return, that's fine. But you'd still expect capital to make a higher return than government debt is currently priced, right? I mean, government debt is currently priced to have a negative real return for 20 years. We're not really saying that we want capital to have a negative real return. So it's not about exploitation. It's simply saying, I want to own some capital. But I also agree that capital should be getting less of a return, but it's still got a better return than my bonds. Mm -hmm. The people buying the bonds at the top are getting a negative real return. And that's Eric's point. I mean, ultimately, that is, in a sense, taxing their wealth because they're swapping it for security. We should then be able to take that and invest it in something that gives an upside. And then as an act of deliberate public policy, give it to the bottom 80%. Mm -hmm. 
And then, you know, if you, if you, like Eric says, if you were able to give families 20,000 euros 10 years from now, it could be materially transformative of so many lives. Oh, yeah, I, you know, yeah, yeah. I proposed a system to give 120,000 euros to everybody. You know, it's, it's, uh, you, yeah. know, you can do it in a different way. You know, you can. Well, that's it. It. But I also think they're complementary. Yeah. I don't think we have to view these objectives as inconsistent. You know, I'm an advocate of a wealth tax. I'm also an advocate of having a higher labor share in GDP. But I don't think that's inconsistent with me saying I also want a broader ownership of the capital base. And I think this is a very good way to fund it and structure it. No, but the broader ownership of the capital base uh, comes from you take the wealth tax proceed and give it to those who have no wealth. You know, you don't need to contribute to the overall, uh, uh, you, know, uh, you know, overall search for higher, uh, higher return on the world capital markets, which in the end, you know, is fed by the profit shares. And, and, and you know, at some point, you know, you have the labor share, you have the profit shares, and, you know, this has to... Uh, so, uh, you know, I think there's so much public investment that we need, you know, just public investment, you know, you don't need, you know, so I, I'm, I'm all with you to borrow at zero percent, but to invest it in, in just public, uh, you know, universities, public uh, hospitals, public uh, infrastructure, you know, rather than investing it on the world uh, capital markets, you know, I guess. Yeah, there is a challenge, that there is a time, you, ha you have a time inconsistency challenge though, because, you know, you and I, like every everyone else with half a brain has been arguing, we should have been doing lots of capital expenditure for the last 20 years, given our cost of capital as a state. The problem here is if I look at the United Kingdom is they can't do the, they, they, every government in the UK has said, I want to do capital expenditure, but they don't. So I'm going, well, I'll tell you what, create an endowment for me and generate a return and when and then let's just approve all your capital projects once you've got them up and ready <laughs> but but whilst you're waiting to do your capital expenditure which seems to be what every government is doing can i at least give some assets to people while we're waiting mm -mm. right that's where i come out mm -mm. Mm -mm. And, and similarly your points are entirely valid with respect to you know dual interest rates but that's governance mm. We, we make them liable. You make the banks liable for doing it. So, you know, if they breach the rules, you punish them and you make the ECB, you know, that's, that's going to be your job now is you've got to make sure that it get that the, that it's net new investment, that there isn't free riding, you know, so you look at what the existing capital expenditure plans are, how much are banks lending for green energy investment. You say, if you want access to our Teltros, that has to grow by two, three, four hundred percent. And you know, and 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 you want to see it. And in, it, it, in energy, it should be regulated returns. So mm -hmm. you should have good national regulation. So you go to Italy and you say, Italy, you will be eligible for thirty percent of GDP on a Teltro. You know, uh, and we will hit our inflation target. But you have to. The governance has to be done properly. So you have to make sure that you are regulating your utilities so that they don't make a, you know, a, an exploitative return on capital. Mm -hmm. No, I think that's probably that's certainly part of the solution. You know, I didn't mean at all to say it was not part of the solution. Uh, Mark and Olivia, yeah. what what should we do now? I think we should adopt everything. No, I think uh, yeah, we um, we probably have to wrap it up. We could continue hours debating these issues, but thank you very much to Mark and to Eric for presenting their work, and um, hopefully, yeah, we'll be in touch in the near future with with some future work, some future discussions and debate. Absolutely, keep us in the loop. We yeah. will. That Thank was you. great fun. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank Thanks you very so much. much for this Bye. discussion. Talk to you soon. Bye. Yeah. Take care. Bye-bye, Mark. Bye. 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 Bye.